Straight Edges Chapter 15, When Mortality Puts on Immortality What exactly is life? I'm asking the question right now in a plain old biological or medical sense. I mean, what's the difference between life and non-life, between the living and the dead? In biology, I remember learning something about the four, at least I can only remember four, basic characteristics of life. Movement, growth, reproduction, and energy consumption and output. But obviously there's more to life than a list of basic characteristics. A list of criteria that helps us recognize life tells us nothing about what it really is. There's nothing to tell us why something moves, grows, reproduces, and uses energy. These characteristics show a thing's living, they don't make it live. We can say, an organism is alive because it moves, grows, reproduces, and uses energy, and whatever those other criteria are. But really, it's not true. A thing moves, grows, reproduces, and uses energy, etc. because it's alive. The life comes first. In fact, life is a great mystery. It's more than a matter of chemicals, of amino acids and proteins and cells and DNA. I mean, what happens when an organism dies? Its physical makeup, in one sense, is the same. The chemical composition is the same. The amino acids and proteins and cells and DNA and all like that haven't gone anywhere. The chemicals have just stopped reacting as they once did. What made them react? They've just stopped being alive. What makes them live? When we get to consciousness, the mystery deepens. In higher animals, there are certain vital signs that we look for as signs of life. We look for a pulse or a heartbeat. We look for respiration. We look for brain activity. And if there are no vital signs, we conclude that the body is dead. But my question is, what is it that makes the heart beat and the lungs go in and out and the brain function? You may say that it's the brain that keeps all the others going, but don't they keep the brain going too? So maybe it's all the vital organs working in conjunction that make something live. That's true as far as it goes, but it doesn't go far enough. Is that all life is? A functioning of organs? So what is it that makes the organs function? They'll still be the same old organs after the life has left the body, so what's changed? Are we alive because our organs function, or do our organs function because we're alive? What I'm getting at here is that there is more to life than meets the microscope. I think that holds true for all levels of life, but especially true when you get to our level, where a concept of a soul or a spirit emerges, the part that experiences and processes and reasons and feels and chooses. It seems obvious to me that the soul is inextricably connected in some way to the organ we call the brain, as long as the brain is alive. But to say that the soul doesn't exist at all, or is no more than the brain, seems nonsense to me. If I am nothing more than a body, dependent on caffeine and oxygen, in that order, then what will have changed after I die? What will be the difference between the living, breathing, walking, talking, thinking me, and the me lying on a slab in the morgue? If humans have no immortal souls, then you, the real you, are nothing more than a set of lungs filling and emptying and a heart muscle pumping blood and a certain amount of brain activity. And when those organs stop performing those functions, there's nothing left of you. The real you that loves and hopes and dreams can be captured and graphed by some piece of hospital equipment. If you were body and only body, the real you would be nothing more than certain behaviors of your atoms, Certain reactions and interactions and chemical processes that cease after you die. Although there's nothing to tell us what makes those atoms behave the way they do when you're alive. Maybe you are nothing more than some random atom activity. Maybe you are nothing more than the functioning of your organs. Maybe that's you, but it ain't me. I am not my cells. Whatever you may happen to be, I know that I am more than the sum total of my atoms. Is there any reason to believe that there must be a life after this one? Is there any reason to think all humans have immortal souls? I think there's a good reason to believe it. I think the main reason I can't help myself believing there must be immortality is because I can't help myself believing that there must be a point. A point to life and a point to us. If there is no immortality, then there is no point. If there's a great void on the other side of the grave, then everything we've waded through in these past chapters is completely pointless. 
is there truth? Well, seeing we can never know it for certain in this life, if this life is all there is, then there might as well be no truth for us. And if this life is all there is, then for us is all we have. Is there a God? Well, maybe, but if this life is all there is, then we can never know him in any kind of absolute way. So for us, there might as well be no God. Is God a God of love? Again, see last answer. We may have some glimmerings that he created us to love and be loved, but we would never find that love very satisfactory if it ends when this life does. Why does evil exist? Why does suffering exist? If this life is all there is, who could say? Evil is a tragedy for which there is no possible happy ending. And suffering, while it may work out a few good results in this life, if this life is all there is, we could hardly admit to suffering being worth it. If, on the other hand, there is a life after this one, then someday we may see the point. Then we may know truth, God, love, and glory. Then suffering may make sense after all. The suffering of this life doesn't last, but if we do, God may allow so much of it because he's thinking long term. The suffering doesn't last, but it can leave lasting impressions for good on the things that last, if there's a life after this one, on ourselves, on our relationships with him, on our relationships with each other, and on others' relationships with him. In everything I've written so far, the reality of immortality has been inherent in every point I've made. Have any of those other chapters we've been through together had any truth in them at all? To me, it looks very much like the conclusions I've come to seem more reasonable than the alternatives. I admit a bias in my own favor, but all the same, that's how I see it. There's a sort of necessity in the conclusions I've come to. Not that I'm taking credit for any of them, you know where I got them. If you leave out any of the basic tenets of truth, God, love, freedom, evil, suffering, or death, you have a picture that doesn't work. It doesn't add up. And I find it's the same with this chapter. Leave out immortality and nothing else adds up. If there is a God and that God is loving and that God is just, then there must be a life after this one. Why do the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer in this life? This life certainly isn't fair. If God is, there must be another life. I think most of us would have to admit that the only possibility that everything may make sense in the end is if this life is not the end. Those who deny immortality must also deny any kind of purpose or sense to the universe. And that is the route many people have taken. I don't believe in all that pie-in-the-sky and happy hunting ground stuff, they say, so I admit it, we live in a senseless universe. Funny thing is, it's kind of like that stubborn refusal to let go of a belief in an absolute moral standard. None of us can do it. None of us can stop ourselves looking for and expecting some kind of point. I can't believe in a pointless universe because I just plain can't. I can no more stop myself looking for meaning and purpose and sense and order and rhyme and reason than I can sprout wings and fly to the moon. And why would I spend all my time looking for a point if I thought there was no point at all to be found? Yet, all of us are the same. We look for point everywhere in everything. Remember that we all have square heads. But if there is no immortality, then there is nothing square in our larger existence. Our heads happen to be square for no purpose at all. There is no corresponding squareness to the universe. There are no straight edges, so we might as well stop looking. But the need to try and make sense of things is written into our hard drives indelibly. Not only pointlessness, but the finality of death seems intolerable and unthinkable to us. Who doesn't rebel at the thought? Again, very strange if we're not immortal souls and death is only natural to us. Even those who deny the existence of the immortal soul seem to feel it necessary to try to hang on to some form of an after-existence. There's the idea of going back into the universe and becoming part of it in some way. All our individual lives are individual cups of water that get poured back into the universal ocean when we die, that type of idea. There's a poetic view of this after-existence that's expressed perfectly in a poem that goes, Do not stand at my grave and weep. I am not there, I do not sleep. I am a thousand winds that blow. I am the diamond glints on snow. I am the sun on ripened grain. I am the gentle autumn rain. When you awaken in the morning's hush, I am the swift uplifting rush. 
of quiet birds in circled light. I am the soft star that shines at night. Do not stand at my grave and cry. I am not there. I did not die. Anonymous. I'm not sure what the poet meant by it, but I know it expresses the sentiment of those who want there to be some kind of after-existence that's not quite an afterlife. It's a beautiful poem. It's a beautiful sentiment. It may even be slightly comforting. In light of what the laws of thermodynamics tell us, there's even truth to it. It's true that when we die, our atoms get recycled. Our bodies go back into the ground and the dust or the ashes that we become turn into something else. Our physical energy goes back into the universe for some other cause. It's the energy of ex-living things that we now use to heat our homes and fuel our cars. My description of these events is not nearly as poetic as the one I quoted above, but it's probably more accurate. I'll tell you what it's not, though. It's not enough. It's not enough for me as regards my own immortality. It's not enough for me as regards the immortality of those I love. I don't really care if my atoms get recycled back into the universe. I am not my atoms. It doesn't matter to me if I someday become petroleum and fill someone's gas tank. I'm not satisfied to become petroleum, valuable as it is. It doesn't even help to think that a part of me could survive on in my offspring, if I had any, who would still be carrying around my genetic material. I'm not my genetic material. I'm me. It's not even helpful to think that I might become a thousand winds that blow or the diamond glints on snow if I don't know I'm those thousand winds or those diamond glints. If there is no conscious life after this one where I know myself as myself, then it all amounts to the same thing for me. For me, I will have ceased to exist. In that case, life is pointless. At least my life is pointless. Of all of these after-existence ideas, the most pointless is the constant recycling not only of our atoms, but of our souls in reincarnation. I say that reincarnation is the most pointless of the afterlife ideas because the pointlessness keeps on getting repeated. All that improving we're supposed to be doing if reincarnation is true doesn't seem to be working, judging by the human race. We're all still busy trying to live by our own moral codes. So all that improving is hampered by the fact that none of us will ever know if we're getting closer to what we're supposed to be doing. Again, if I don't know myself as myself after I die, then I, the real me, the me I am now, has ceased to exist. It's all pointlessness. And again, I can't believe in a pointless universe because I just plain can't. Let's take a look at the source I've been quoting all book long to see what it tells us about the life after this one. I'll warn you in advance, it pulls no punches, as you'll see. It very definitely proclaims both a heaven and a hell. I'll let it speak for itself. Here are some of the things it has to say on the subject. First, the good news. Psalm 16, verses 10 to 11. For you do not give me up to Sheol, or let your faithful ones see the pit. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 23, verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Job 19, verses 25 to 26. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. All through the Bible is the promise of immortality. Those were a small sampling from the first part, the Old Testament, now over to the New Testament, the second part. 1 Corinthians 15.53 For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. 2 Peter 3.12-13 Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Revelation 21, verses 1 to 4. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. 
In the New Testament, the good news of immortality is usually coupled with the bad news of immortality. A few verses later we read, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Revelation 21 verse 8. Then the chapter goes on to describe a holy city where God's very presence dwells and tells us about it in terms of streets of gold and pearly gates among other jewels. And then, to let us know that we have to be perfect to go there, it says, But nothing unclean will enter it, nor any one who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Revelation 21, verse 27. Then there's the popular John 3.16 and the not-so-popular John 3.18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Matthew 13, verses 41 to 43. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Matthew twenty five forty one and 46. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Someone asked him, Lord, will only a few be saved? He said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able. But he will say, I do not know where you come from. Go away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Luke 13, verses 23 to 24 and 27 to 28a. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Luke 16, verses 23 to 24. Second Thessalonians 1, verses 8 and 9. In flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, these will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction separated from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. And from the Old Testament again, Isaiah 66, verse 24. And they shall go out and look at the dead bodies of the people who have rebelled against me, for their worm shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. Quoted three times by Jesus in Mark 9, 44, 46, and 48, to refer to the never-ending existence of hell. These passages need to be examined in context to get the best sense of them, but nonetheless their statements are plain. We've examined a few of the passages that tell us about the afterlife, I won't even begin to try to tell you how much of the language used is the language of imagery put in terms we can readily grasp and how much is literal. I won't try to guess because I don't know. I have to admit to you that some of the images the Bible uses to tell us about heaven don't excite me. Golden streets and pearly gates don't move me because, frankly, I don't give a rip about gold and jewels. I would be a lot more excited by the Bible's description of heaven if it used images like pine trees and mountains and first snowfalls. There are people who don't give a rip about pine trees and mountains and first snowfalls, especially the snowfalls, so my images might not convey the right message to other people either. There's a little girl I knew once who confided in me that she wanted to go to heaven, but she wanted me to assure her that heaven would be what she wanted it to be. She wasn't sure she wanted to go to a heaven where she couldn't have her horse or where she didn't live next to the river where she lived at the time. Don't all of us tend to feel that there are bits of earth we wouldn't want to leave behind and that God couldn't possibly do anything better than them? If visions of heaven had been given to my little friend like they were to the biblical writer, they might have included horses and rivers like mine might have included pine trees and mountains. Maybe the biblical writer was given a vision of heaven involving images of gold and all manner of precious stones because, to many, those are the substances of the highest worth and beauty they can imagine. Maybe, I say, because I really don't know. What I would say is what I tried to explain to the little girl. It really won't matter if there are horses and rivers or pine trees and mountains or gold and jewels. There may be. I don't know. But what I know there will be is God. 
his presence in an unveiled way, and in his presence is fullness of joy. Did you notice from the passages on heaven I quoted to you the joy and the delight and the bliss of heaven come simply from being in his presence? He's the one who came up with horses and rivers and pine trees and mountains and romance and laughter and music and eating and drinking and even golden jewels in the first place. I've told you that it's probably not the things themselves that we're attached to anyway. It's the feelings those things are the medium for. Imagine no longer needing the medium because we're right there in the presence of the actual fact behind the feelings. Those feelings in their media are a small part of what he's capable of coming up with. Right now we can see some of the gifts that have come from his hand and so we catch a glimpse of the hand. They're good gifts and it's a very good hand. One day we'll be able to look from the hand to the face to know the heart. If the hand is this incredible, what will be the face? What is the heart? The Apostle Paul phrased it this way, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12a. I'd put it this way, Right now we sip through a straw from a cracked cup drawn from a polluted well. Still, we long for those sips, not very satisfying as they are. One day we'll be able to jump in and bathe in the source. I leave the details up to God. I just want Him. That's all I know for sure. I know very little about the afterlife. A lot of things are unclear about it from the Bible. Like, try explaining color to a blind man. Some things are going to be unclear. This is what is clear from the Bible, so this is what I know. It will be forever. It will be conscious. We will know ourselves as ourselves. God will be wholly present in the one state of existence. God will be wholly absent in the other. His presence makes the one pure delight. His absence makes the other pure the opposite. Both the delight and its opposite will be conscious and eternal. And now you can blurt out all those questions you're dying to throw at me. But why does it have to be that way? Couldn't God have done things differently? I mean, couldn't there be a heaven without also having to be a hell? Sure, I admit it's a nice idea to think we can be perfect and live forever in a perfect state of perfect delight. But why should we also have to think that there must be a state of torment forever as well? There is a popular idea, even among Bible-believing Christians, that there is a heaven, but that there is no hell, or at least that hell is not as I've portrayed it, a place of eternal, conscious destruction. The idea is that, granted, not everyone goes to heaven when they die, but neither does anyone go to the kind of hell I've been describing. Some people just cease to exist. The idea is one of destruction, but not an everlasting conscious destruction, just a momentary one. Those who choose against God will be destroyed in a hell of sorts, but it will be all over and done with at once. There's a great many people who believe the Bible who get around its uncomfortable teachings on hell by making hell mean this kind of an annihilation. I can see where these people are coming from. After all, almost always when the Bible talks about hell, it pictures it in terms of fire, the most obvious feature of fire, besides its heat, is its destructive power. It burns things up and there's nothing left, nothing recognizable anyway. When the Bible uses terms like eternal destruction, 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 9, and eternal punishment, Matthew 25 verse 46, might it not mean that the destruction of those who don't go to heaven is final and so is eternal? The punishment lies in being banished from God's presence and then ceasing to exist. It's everlasting in that it's irreversible. It lasts forever. Isn't that compatible with what the Bible teaches? It's a much more comfortable idea, as terrible as the idea is that some people will just cease to exist. It's a great deal more terrible to think that they'll exist forever in a state of conscious weeping and gnashing of teeth. There are a couple of reasons that I can't buy into this more comfortable idea of hell much as I'd like to. For one, I don't think it's what the Bible really teaches. Of course, that may not have much sway with you at this time, but it's the reason I personally can't buy into the more comfortable idea of hell. The passages I quoted to you earlier just don't seem to fit with this hell as annihilation doctrine. That's one reason I believe that hell is a state of conscious, eternal destruction and punishment. A final, conscious state of separation from God. The Bible certainly seems to tell us so. The other reason is that I can't quite reconcile this more comfortable idea of hell as annihilation with everything else I've seen about God's way of doing things. I suppose the question comes down to, are we truly immortal or not? 
If we want there to be an eternal, conscious, final dwelling place of delight in God's presence, maybe we have to admit to its opposite. If we want there to be a heaven, maybe there has to be a hell. How else could God have ordered things? If he made immortal souls capable of free choice, wouldn't those souls have to be immortal, no matter the choice? I think those who believe in a heaven, but not hell, have erred in how they see the nature of immortality. It's as though possessing an immortal soul is not part and parcel of being human, but as though immortality is a kind of reward that's conferred on some humans after death, and on some it's not conferred. Those others never were and never will be immortal. But I don't think that's the true nature of immortality. It seems to me that if God were going to create creatures capable of loving him, capable of communing with him, literally capable of having communication with him, capable of making the kind of immortal choices we're talking about, then those creatures had to be immortal. Remember the child's plastic, hammer, and saw? They're made of cheap, flimsy stuff that isn't capable of producing anything of real value. Where the stakes are low, nothing much can be lost, but nothing much can be won. Is it possible that an immortal soul could cease to exist? Now there's a contradiction in terms for you. So if some will cease to exist entirely, then we would have to say that we don't all start off with an immortal soul, but are given one after death. That would mean we have a kind of disposable soul here in this life. Could God have created styrofoam souls, disposable souls, capable of knowing him? Remember that if there is no immortal soul in a man, then he is nothing more than a set of lungs and a heart and a brain and a few more bare necessities like that. Can a kidney know God? Can a liver commune with its maker? Even a brain, could any organ that is nothing more than an organ do what God created us to do? I rather doubt it. Any kind of disposable soul ends up looking like no soul at all. Or if he created some souls immortal knowing they would choose him in the end, and others destructible, because he knows the final outcome, and he knows that these are the souls who would reject him. Would we not be justified to accuse him of unfairness? Maybe it was all based on his all-knowingness, but then what chance did the styrofoam souls ever have? They never stood any chance of immortality. Is it even possible God could have done things that way? That would, in actual fact, make some bodies no more than bodies, but some others, immortal souls and entirely different, worlds different, universes different. That would make some humans merely animal, not capable of knowing spiritual realities, and some humans human, with souls and spirits. I was writing facetiously at the beginning of the chapter when I told you that you may be no more than a set of lungs and a heart and a brain, but that I know that I'm bigger than my body. But like it or not, you're bigger than your body, too. Of course God wouldn't have made two different types of humans, yet I think this is the position we put God in if we try to do away with an eternal hell. Only if we accept the idea that all humans start off with an immortal soul can we see the possibility of every one of us having the chance to live forever with God. And I don't know that God could have done things differently. An artist creates out of his own nature. Looking at his art, there's some part of his nature we see. Other acts he performs may not flow directly out of his nature, but his art will. Especially in a self-portrait, we see to a certain extent just how it is that an artist sees himself. This is what I'm thinking. God couldn't make creatures, sons and daughters, in his image, capable of being loved and loving him freely, capable of comprehending enough of him that they could love him freely, and not make them immortal. His nature is life. Death is not part of his nature, so he couldn't make creatures in his image for whom death was part of their nature. Even in the way he made the rest of his creation, death is not part of its nature. An artist may issue curses that don't flow directly out of his deepest nature. God could issue death as a curse, death of our physical bodies, although that curse was a curse of mercy, as we've seen, and mercy is part of his nature. But in the act of creation, what he created flowed directly out of his nature, just as an artist's creations must. We had to reflect him. God is immortal. He is ever-living. So, too, must be a creature in his image, his self-portrait. Only this kind of creature would be capable of the kind of relationship with him that he looks for. You may still rebel against the idea. Why should he gamble on people's immortal souls? If he's the one risking, why isn't he the one paying? Rather, why should people gamble on their own immortal souls? And he was the one who paid, but no time for that subject here. 
It's the immortal souls who are the ones doing the gambling, aren't they? If you disbelieve everything I'm saying here about immortality, you're the one taking the risk that immortality is nothing more than a thousand winds that blow or a cup of water being poured back into the sea. I'm not much of a gambler myself. I'm not prepared to take that risk. Furthermore, I really don't want to. I very much want there to be a heaven. And from everything else I've thought likely to be true, it looks as though heaven must also be true. But if that's the case, then it looks like I'll have to admit to a hell as well. I can't have it both ways. <laughs>